Okay, thank you, thank you, Gail. Uh, so we're moving on to uh, describing the thousand genomes data sets, including uh, the raw sequence data uh, and uh, the, the, the met sequence data and the variant calls. Um, Gail described the three uh, 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 coverage strategies that were uh, that were for which we collected data in the project and uh, uh, the goals of the various pilots. Uh, moving on to the samples, uh, uh, the Exxon pilot, uh, which used the highest number of samples in all 697 samples, uh, represented seven different populations, um, three from uh, uh, Asia, two for, uh, from Europe, and two from uh, Africa. Uh, the, the other two projects use su subsets of these samples. The uh, uh, low coverage project used four uh, samples from four of these populations, and of course the trio project used uh, two trios, one European and one uh, Asian trio. Uh, Gil also talked about the, 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 the data sets uh, and how uh, basically uh, we were able to compare using these uh, data sets uh, uh, deep coverage in a small number of samples with uh, uh, low coverage, but genome-wide shotgun sequencing in about close to 200 samples, and then going very deep in a small fraction of the genome. In fact, a fairly small fraction of the of the exome, about 5% of the of the human exome in the exome pilot project from a large number of individuals. Uh, no matter where the data came from, the data processing uh, was done in a uniform fashion. Uh, this was. Uh, what's called a resequencing project in the sense that we use the existing human reference sequence to organize all the data. Uh, that is, once the machine scheme, uh, once the read scheme of the machine and they were converted into, into, into reads, uh, they were mapped to the, uh, the, the reference genome, uh, after which uh, we called variants both uh, single base or short insertion uh, deletion type variants and structural variants, uh, which will be covered in a separate presentation by Jan. Uh, m the mapping itself uh, was successful, but we must realize that, that uh, although next generation sequencing technologies uh, enable very cost effective and fast uh, high throughput sequencing, but they can do everything. It turns out that there are limitations in terms of what fraction of the genome is reachable. On the, uh, on the top, you'll see um, a, a, a figure from the old uh, 2001 uh, human genome paper that shows that a large fraction of the human genome, nearly, uh, nearly half of the human genome, consists of repetitive DNA. And of course, uh, it, it turns out that we are able to sequence a large fraction of the repetitive parts of the human genome, but not all. Turns out that 80-some uh, percent of the human genome uh, is, uh, was sequenceable with the technologies that we used in the pilot data, and, uh, and there is, is some fraction of the genome that uh, we really weren't able to touch and we weren't able to assay um, for variation discovery. But, so this is important to keep in mind when we are um, considering how complete the resource is. So we are, um, there, uh, there were limitations, but most of the genomes were, uh, we were able to assay. There were other challenges after the read mapping step is done, um, and some people are familiar with these. These are somewhat technical details, but uh, during library construction and sequencing, there are a number of uh, amplification steps, and because of that, uh, you end up uh, sometimes uh, sampling uh, clonal uh, copies of a single sequencing fragment, which uh, introduces systematic biases into uh, variant calling and need to be dealt with. Uh, there are also limitations to the alignment technologies. Uh, some exa uh, examples include situations when you have uh, an insertion deletion uh, uh, polymorphism in the uh, in, 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 the, in the sequence samples, and that can throw off the alignment algorithms. And there are we now have specific uh, methods that can clean that data up. There's also more subtle points such as base quality values that are not well calibrated at the beginning, and again, this introduces systematic biases. All these things can be dealt with, and uh, the project developed methods to deal with these issues. Um, and once uh, the alignments are up to the standard, uh, 
the next step is to actually detect the variants. And I'm going to be talking in this presentation only about SNP variants, and the structural variants will be covered in a separate one. So SNP calling uh, 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 with, with current methodologies are done considering all the data for all the individuals simultaneously. So data in this case would be available from uh, uh, a, number of, uh, a number of individual samples. Uh, the data, uh, uh, this, this specific uh, 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 method would be a Bayesian method where we calculate data genotype likelihoods or data likelihoods based on the, the data collected from the individuals. We are able to aggregate this data uh, and uh, use prior knowledge about for example, the allele frequency distribution and the frequency of polymorphic size, polymorphism rate in the human genome, and, we, and, and, and use this information to make better inference as to where the variant locations are, uh, which is called SNP calls. And uh, also, we are able to infer the genotype of the samples based on the data. These are called genotype calls. And uh, Gil referred to these in his presentation. And I'm going to come back to genotype calling a little bit later. A very important aspect of the Townsend Genome Project was that uh, uh, it, it uh, was able to uh, benefit from uh, a number of, uh, of uh, competent analysis groups. And each project uh, data set was analyzed by at least two, but often a, a, a higher number of different groups, developing often uh, quasi-independent methods, which could then be compared at, at various checkpoints. And uh, data releases have tended to benefit from the best of, uh, of each method and merging uh, the, the, the SNP calls from the various different methods. This is just one specific example from the, from the part of the project, the Exxon pilot, where my group was primarily involved in, but similar pipelines. Um, implementing steps that deal with the, the, uh, the difficulties that I was describing below uh, have been implemented. So uh, what, uh, what were the results? Uh, well, this is a fairly dense table uh, looking at uh, the, the, the uh, variant calling results from each of the three uh, thousand genomes pilot projects. The raw data uh, was pretty staggering and now it's even much, even much bigger. Um, uh, multiple terabyte, uh, terabases of sequence. Uh, we found uh, about uh, uh, between five and ten million SNPs for the for the trios, fifteen millions for the from the low coverage samples. Uh, these are remember these are both whole genome uh, data sets, and over twelve thousand in the exome pilot. Again, looking at a very small cross section uh, section of the genome, about five percent. Of the of the of the hum, of human genes, turns out that uh, uh, many of the variants that we found are not were novel. Uh, novelty rate was highest in the exome pilot because a large number of samples we were able to discover very rare variants, and we know that these are underrepresented in current databases. Uh, in addition to the SNPs, uh, and these are just the results, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, the, uh, well over a million short insertion deletion type variants, uh, and um, uh, o o uh, over 15,000 larger deletions were also found. Uh, we were able to detect with a base pair resolution uh, a large number of structural variant breakpoints where a large uh, structural variant actually starts and ends, and we're able to discover uh, new variation types that are, 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 are very interesting in their own right, for example, mobile element insertions in large numbers and doubling and tripling uh, the, uh, the existing catalog of, of, of these variants. Important to mention that the project standard was to have a false discovery rate better than 5%. And uh, all pilots uh, met this criteria, uh, which means that when you, know, you look at um, variant call sets that we produced, you can be certain that 95 out of 100 variants will be real, and uh, uh, so the, the false positive rate will be very low. Uh, Gil talked about uh, uh, calling genotypes, determining whether the individual is homozygous for the reference allele, heterozygous or homozygous for the alternate allele. Uh, 
Now, from first principles, this should be very difficult for low coverage data because sometimes there are no reads available from a given individual. I was very, very surprised to see that often very accurate genotype calls were made from, uh, for samples for which there was not a single read aligned at a given location, and that's, that's because of the power of, of linkage disequilibrium-based methods. And this uh, figure compares the accuracy uh, within the same samples between the exon pilot, which was deep sequencing to the um, low coverage pilot and you can see that the accuracy is actually very very high for the low coverage samples despite um, often missing information. Uh, the flip side of accuracy is sensitivity or power that is what fraction of the sites you discovered and what fraction of the sites you missed. Uh, we were able to do multiple different comparisons within and outside the project. For example, looking at um, uh, 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 SNPs from the HAP map and uh, uh, comparing the low coverage to the Exxon project. You can see that uh, uh, if you have at least uh, seven or eight chromosomes with the variant allele in your collection, basically you can you discover that SNP 100% uh, of the time, even with low coverage sequencing. It turns out that the deep coverage uh, uh, you, are, you can do better. Uh, you can go and you're sensitive down to uh, two alleles and you discover even a large uh, fraction of the singletons. Again, that's because, you're, uh, because of the de deep coverage. This, well, it's a sl slightly difficult to see the numbers here, but there are a very, very large number of uh, novel variants uh, found in, this, in, you know, in the project, multiple millions of, 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 of novel variants, which is a large contribution of this project to uh, known uh, polymorphic sites in humans. Now, this was all sort of like population level quantities. What about a per individual? Each individual in the project, uh, uh, in this project, uh, we found about three to four million variants, uh, uh, including 10 to 11,000 non-synonymous changes, um, uh, a couple of hundred in-frame indels, uh, about 100 premature uh, stop codons, uh, about 50 splice site disruptions, and 50 to 100 recessive disease-causing mutations present in a database of, of uh, uh, human um, disease variations. Uh, in terms of introspection, comparing uh, again between the various projects, as I mentioned, the Exxon pilot uh, deployed deeper sequencing, 25x and higher per sample, and because of that, we were able to uh, uh, discover more at the low end of the LEO frequency spectrum, and that's exactly what was the reason. That's, that's one of the most important reasons why the, uh, the Exxon pilot was carried out, so we can see what we're missing with uh, the low coverage sequence. LEO frequency, it's, it's really um, LEO count. Uh, the low coverage was about uh, two to six x per sample, and uh, the high coverage is twenty five x and on. There were some samples with a hundred x coverage in the Exxon pilot, so that was. I could, I could, so yes, it, at least I can speak for the Exxon pilot. There was significant difference in the coverage between uh, 454 and Illumina, which is the two platforms that were used. But it turns out that there were no real difference between, uh, up to 20x. So, so the coverage distributions look almost identical up to 20x. So it didn't really affect the discovery rate of the SNPs. Both platforms were equally suitable for discovery. Um, what, just the last slide about the Exxon pilot, which of course is close to my heart, is that there really is a huge um, excess of rare variants uh, in this data set, which allowed us to really look below the 1% area frequency, um, uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't have time to describe the actual uh, science uh, uh, of, this, of, these, of these analyses. Uh, one slide, uh, the 1000 data supports structural variants from the next gen uh, uh, sequencing data. Again, details to come. Uh, and uh, one thing that I couldn't resist to put in here, since these are 
two different, completely different variation types, SNPs and mobile element insertions, such as ALO insertions or L1 insertions, in the same exact data from the same individuals, we could calculate and compare heterozygosity. I think that's a real power of these data sets uh, that um, we will, we are, we're exploiting. Uh, what are the data types that are delivered by this project? Uh, the reads in FASTQ format, and uh, Steve, I believe, will be talking a little bit more about uh, data formats. Uh, the alignments, reads mapped to the genome in a standard BAM or SAM-BAM format. Uh, and the variant calls in what's called a VCF or variant call format. Uh, very important that uh, there are tools available developed by a number of groups that you can use, uh, download and use uh, to analyze and manipulate the thousand genome data. For example, uh, you can take the BAM files, the alignments, and uh, you can uh, calculate various metrics, you can calculate coverage, you can discover your own variants, uh, and so on. Uh, you can also, there's a, a set of tools called VCF tools that is able to manipulate the variant calls in their own particular format. You can use uh, viewer programs. I just showing one example here, the Gambit viewer from my group, but there are others, for example, the IGV viewer from the Broad Institute, to actually look at this data, look at the, the data sets. It's pretty efficient browsing now. Um, and then moving on, so this was the pilot, and these were the tools. One slide about where we are right now. Uh, so the current status uh, is we analyzed 629 samples, and this supports 25 and a half million variant calls. So very, very good progress, uh, very high, um, very low uh, uh, missed SNP rate, and very high quality. Uh, Gil talked a little bit about the continuation, uh, the, the second uh, uh, phase of the project, expanding the number of samples to 1,100 and, and then beyond 2,500, uh, which will uh, consist both of uh, low coverage whole genome sequ sequencing, 4x, uh, or perhaps a little higher per sample. Uh, and this will give us uh, an even more <laughs> complete SNP catalog of, the, uh, of uh, genomic variants uh, about 1% about LER frequency. And in addition to that, there will be full exome sequencing on all the samples, which will go below 1% LER frequency in, these, uh, in, in, the, in the exome. And finally, uh, we'll acknowledge the Thousand Genomes Project, all the participants that contributed this work. Yes, there is time for questions. You probably have to yell because it's kind of difficult to see with the lights on. Okay, I have a question about the... Please use the microphones. We're recording this. Thank you. The URLs for the tools that you listed didn't show up well in the handout. Mm -hmm. Will they be made available for us uh, later? Or? I, I believe that the presentations will also be posted and accessible, so people can download them. They should be uh, better accessible that way. It, it, they will be posted at genome.gov, which is the NHGRI's website. Yeah. And uh, these will be, come online in about a week. Uh, I have a question about the Exxon pilot data set. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you did not identify short indels in it, just SNPs. Uh, I'm surprised if, uh, if you didn't see, for example, in-frame deletions or, or things like that in, in the Exxon data set. Uh, I believe there are reports in the literature for, for such types, so it's, it's surprising that you didn't see that. Uh, we did see that. I just didn't talk about that. Uh, okay, we, because it's not reporting in the table right, that right. we have here. Th there were about a, uh, there were about a hundred uh, insertions, uh, short insertion deletions in the exons, um, and some of these were in frame, um, most of which were at, at low LU frequency, uh, as you would expect from these highly, most likely functional right. variants. Oh, okay. Thanks. Just one question. I heard that uh, more samples will be available in the future for in the for a full exome, meaning 
this 1000 genes or all the really all the exons in meaning the, the full exons so all the all the human genes well all the ones for which capture arrays exist so you, you will do capture arrays for all the exons together mm. and yes yes there are i believe at least two but maybe a larger number of 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 of, of full exon capture arrays okay. for the human genome available today Fine, thank that people are using yes you spoke about a global target of under 5% for the false discovery rate mm -hmm. in the project. Could you discuss a little bit how you determine that? Uh, these were done with validation, ex experimental validation experiments, which uh, consisted, uh, uh, there were multiple different strategies used. There was direct uh, Sanger-based uh, resequencing and also genotyping. And, uh, uh, and uh, these show that uh, the this, depending on the project, they were slightly different, but they were all uh, uh, above 95% accuracy. The sensitivity, of course, was not experimentally determined because it's generally much more difficult, but they were, uh, comp uh, uh, they were uh, determined from comparison to other projects with overlapping. Well, that's a good question. It's anybody's question. Uh, I can't really answer that. Uh, uh, HGMD uh, is probably the best currently available data, say, da uh, uh, data set. We did not follow up uh, on, on these uh, in that regard. The, the, these, this was not a disease project primarily. This was a, a, a project that, were set, that set out to assay human genetic variation on a population scale, but not uh, in a disease context. Those are, of course, interesting questions, but there are, would be other studies that will answer those. Any other questions? In that case, uh, moving on to the next presentation, Steve Sherry.